no media will ever pick up these things. Media is going to make money on the name of rape. Why the media showing now rapes more than ever? So that's what I'm saying. The, this Gan Tantra, Praja Tantra and Jan Tantra. Three words are there which is not an not a exact meaning of democracy. So the word democracy is the French and the English ideas. And we are really keep on following those things. These are not really Indian words. and There's not a really words which one uh, uh, India is supposed to be. Chanakya say very clear that when Jan Tantra come, the Janta run the whole thing. When Gan Tantra come, Gan Manya Vyakti, the people who are really choose good people, they go and uh, rule. And Praja Tantra, they talk about king and uh, the Praja. They don't talk about that one. So which Tantra we have now, that we should really find out that one, go deep into it. Yeah, that's, it. that's an interesting way of putting things. But then it reduces, uh, if you reduce democracy to mobocracy, as you believe, it becomes a bhirtam, uh, which is uh, crowd uh, gathering. Well, if you are affected and you have a grievance, uh, why should people come out and protest and shout slogans? What is wrong in that? If those elementary civic freedoms are not available, and in fact, this happens to be true in large parts of the country. Even in Delhi, we find it difficult to organize a demonstration anywhere outside Jantar Mantar. Jantar Mantar has become some like a uh, zoo where we are confined. And no all our is really where so, go. So, I mean, I wish that there was Bhir Tantra. I wish that more people would come out in the street and join uh, the protests. Unfortunately, it's the opposite that is happening. The law is creating conditions where we find it difficult to even come out and protest elementary things, to hold a protest or to distribute pamphlets. Ten years back what we could do, we find it difficult to do. You know in 2001 what the NDA government did, Americans were, had attacked Afghanistan after 2001 in December. But they filed sedition cases against people who were distributing pamphlets opposing the war that the Americans had lost. They filed sedition cases against them. I mean, this is, <laughs> so the problem of our institutions, I don't think it's a mere change of law or that accepting preamble or internalizing preamble. I think it requires a major transformation of Indian state and society. We require a social revolution along with uh, a material transformation. Uh, you know, the kind of inequality that exists in, the, in, in our country and the, the racism that exists. It's, it, it calls for much larger protests, for many more people to come out and protest. I mean, I would have loved to see uh, the 100,000 people come out protesting against the rape of Dalit girls. When they were sitting in Delhi, the Bagana, five women who were raped by the, by the upper caste, they're sitting in Delhi, how many thousands of people, except for the left and progressive circles, nobody joined it. The others, the right wing, which was so active in the nearby, so that also, in the long run, that is also helpful. Because that polarization is very important also. That the right will not take you to the path of justice and equality. Right cannot take you. Only left and progressives can take you there. That is also important. We can't be oblivious of these uh, things. So, you are right that, you know, Bhirtant may be a scary proposition. But our problem is that we don't have people coming out and protesting. My lament has been for 25 years, how many thousands have come out to protest against what was being done to Kashmiri Muslims by the Indian security forces or the Indian army, even protesting, without saying anything in the favor of their Azadi, that we will not allow rape, torture and killing of anybody in Kashmir, just as we are demanding that for Gaza. Why did why did we not do it? Because, it, you know, Kashmiris know the Indian state. They don't hate Indian state as much as they hate the Indian intelligentsia for betraying them and not standing up for them. Please remember that. Sorry. Uh, this is a small question. <coughs> so, um, um, there was some discussion about what is Indian civil society and so on and about how 
Indian mainstream society does not care about the, the issues that are happening. Um, it's primarily because it's they've been constructed, like you said, as the other, and the, uh, and the other whether it's uh, Chhattisgarh or Manipur or Kashmir or Muslims, and so the other is defined in relation to the self, which is the Indian nationalistic self. Uh, you know, you can say right now there's a Hindu nationalistic project going on, but it's not a new thing. It's been even the Congress has that undercurrent of of it. Um, so there is a kind of ideological basis for this indifference and you know n now we have like uh, Modi who was largely forgiven for what happened in Gujarat where it was whatever extra constitutional. So you, when you're talking to this majoritarian nationalist identity, the self, uh, you know it's like 95-90% uh, of Israelis support the ongoing offensive right, right now in Gaza. So, by appealing to legal constitutional principles, how much, that's one way of saying, we, I'm trying to reason with you, whatever you agree, but um, shouldn't this nationalistic project itself be dismantled, like the social revolution, uh, which, I don't know, you know, there have been people like Fule, for example, who've been working on that. Um, what what is your take on on that? I mean, the left doesn't really take take on itself the project for you know. Do you think like deconstructing what this means? Uh, um, no, I uh, and it it's based on like Kashmir, for example, is based on this di continuous long term our culture tradition, right? So kind of examining what is this culture and you know. And yeah. you mentioned about the Indian civilization being very violent, but has there been more articulation about why that is? You know, other people have tried to articulate that about examining Indian society and what the contradictions are. I'm sure that everybody has. I mean, I, I'm the, I have no scholarship of that nature. I'm just responding to it on the basis of my own understanding, having worked uh, a little bit of reading. So it's I'm drawing on that. I don't have any scholarship which establishes, you know, what I'm saying. So I could in fact be dismissed by some scholar by saying that that's absurd. Uh, but I'll still stick to it because I, I do not believe that the Hinduism offers uh, within itself and in its fold the way in which it has been imagined and uh, has evolved uh, the possibilities of, uh, uh, of equality. Uh, so at that level it comes easy. Self and the other comes easy to Indians or to a category of Indians, a, a section of the Indians, it comes very easy because, and please understand, I mean, I'm also talking with the vantage point of somebody who's uh, the, the post-independence generation. So there are a lot of things that we grew up believing, which then got demolished. And our dreams died rather young. So that's why I mean, when, uh, a lot of people, when they got influenced by what happened in the 60s, the Naxalbari movement, uh, it wasn't out of some uh, vacuum. There was a context within which it took place. The, the, the point I'm trying to make is that this self and other is both is there in our tradition, in our culture, but addressing at the level of culture itself doesn't will not. Uh, suffice because there is a deliberateness which goes into it. The policy making makes or the Indian, the, the ruling class politics or the, the way in which the Indian establishment uh, visualizes and perceives various issues uh, are play a far bigger role in creating this divide between self and other. It is a deliberate, I mean this whole nationalist, so called nationalist imagination, nobody has looked at it. I mean, there is no one nationalist imagination in India. And it would be wrong to even come to, to say that there is one. There are multiple. There are multiple visions and perspectives that are contending. And that's also one way of visualizing uh, the Indianness as not being one repository, you know, which draws only from one tradition or one uh, uh, source, but of multiple sources. So you can see it as an enriching experience or you can see it 
as many majoritarians believe, something like a chaotic experience that it would result because it would be a mishmash, neither this nor that. You know, they, that is also the fear. But majoritarianism has very much an intrinsic part of this whole project because the nation state project, if you write, go, go to the constitution assembly debates, for instance. It's remarkable for many things that are present there in, 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 in a very early form, which makes it very clear that the majority libertarian tendencies were there even at the time of the making of a constitution. So look at the way in which we dealt with the Dalit and the Anglo-Indian issue versus the Muslim issue. The question of protection or uh, uh, 